Good afternoon and welcome to you all from the School and Nursery Show here in Dubai. My name is Fiona Cottam and I'm the Principal at Heartland International School. And this is the final panel discussion that has taken place over the last two days. It's been an incredible show. Thousands of people have joined us here in the very real world. But many more thousands of you have joined us virtually to listen to these discussions after the event from the comfort of your home. The final um, session of today actually is, is a very interesting and, and very open discussion point, and one that many of us are trying to crystal ball gaze in terms of what the future will look like. The topic is the changing face of education in the virtual world. And I'm so glad in some ways that I'm the person asking the questions rather than having to answer that. But I'm delighted this afternoon to be joined by um, a group of experts um, who all come from a range of different schools and with a range of different experiences. To my left is Paul Kelly, who is head of secondary at Sunmark School. Beside him, Craig Lampshade, a colleague of many years and who will be the principal at the Royal Grammar School Dubai, which will open in this coming September. And also David Hudson, um, who is the head of school at Dwight, and we've, we've done a couple of panels together over the last couple of days, David. So look, a big question, you know, the changing face of education, and we have moved into different times. Um, Microsoft Teams, Zooms, all the different pieces of technology. Um, suddenly Seesaw has become one of the most important things that we have, um, that we took for granted before. Paul, what are your views? I mean, you just come to Dubai from Shanghai, where you were for sort of 10 years before. Mm -hmm. The changing face of education, the virtual world. Yeah, it's, it's um, everyone could see it coming and then it hit us hard. When, when COVID came because it, it, it went from something that we were choosing to opt in and out of to something that we had to do in order to manage it. Um, I mean, in a funny way, COVID has been probably the best CPD teachers will ever get because um, they have to engage in it. And, and um, there's a, been a lot of learning that's been done by, by our colleagues through this process. Um, you said earlier, crystal ball gazing, exactly what it is. We're, we're all waiting to understand what it's going to look like in, in another three years, five years. Um, synchronous, asynchronous, are we going to be combining these things together? Um, I, I can see moving forward that we're, there are going to be more virtual schools popping up. Um, obviously, I think there, there's some challenges with uh, social um, well-being that, that come with that. But uh, I think most of us uh, would be happy to go and find a, 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 a balance between our more traditional education and the virtual approach that I think we're going to be forced into using. Mm. Craig, you know, the Royal G Grammar School Guildford's Dubai about to open its doors in September, a, a blank sheet of paper in, in so many ways, albeit um, hundreds of years of history. Um, education in the virtual world, how is that fitting into the scheme of things in terms of the plan for you opening your new school? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a really good point. I mean, going back to what Paul said, I think it's been a bit of a, a wake up for education in terms of uh, choosing into this or buying into this. I think in terms of if you look at us, I mean, we are, I suppose we have that blank sheet. So we're looking across all the systems, ed tech, through to, so I suppose, the systems that sit behind the support of ed tech. Um, so, yeah, things like VR, things like immersive education, immersive rooms. I think the real point is, I mean, schools have dabbled in this for sort of 10 years. I mean, it's been around. And as you said before, there's been some lighthouse schools, but now sort of everyone has to do it. Everyone's sort of bought in. I think there's still a lot of learning to say what actually adds value to student learning. You know, what's, what's mimic and gimmick and what's, uh, what's the real value in terms of how does it add value? I think the other piece will be um, not only in terms of the academic, in terms of what students experience in terms of their academic curriculum provision but the welfare piece i think there's a lot to be said how are we going to use it and vr to actually track and engage students in terms of a welfare piece and that's something we're looking at now is you know what does that look like how can how can that support us in being much more intelligent to support kids especially coming back in after covid where they haven't had those social interactions you know, where they haven't been in classrooms and we were talking about just before the you know the richness of what that brings and, and i suppose what children have missed over the last 12 to 18 months. So I think there's a piece of work to be done there, which is going to be very interesting moving forward. But yeah, we're very lucky. I'm just going to stay here for a moment because we, we have a, a we, we do it, we do it by, by instinct, don't we? Um, immersive education, ed tech, IT. Um, what does that mean to the parent at home? You know, we, we use lots of jargon, don't we, in education, and we take it for granted. But what will it look like for the parent? So I suppose the immersive ed, the immersive, immersive education part is is sort of walking into a room like this, I guess, and and being fully immersed in your surroundings. So being able to manipulate that 
um, you know, 360 degree view cameras, full 360 sound, and children actually being in places which, which you know, sort of transform them. It's almost like the Star Trek holodeck type idea. You know, you've gone from place X to place Y, and, and you're experiencing that in a whole different realm of just sitting there watching a computer. Um, and I suppose it's the same in terms of VR, you know, so, and that gives you an amazing opportunity to do things which you can't do on site. You know, you can act in terms of, I suppose, uh, experiments or literally um, space and dimension and, and being able to sort of, you know, I suppose, uh, get a much better feeling for those those dimensions. I mean, I was reading something not too long ago about a young man, I can't recall his name, but um, basically it was, it was him saying that had he not been able to access state-of-the-art, and I mean industrial type um, uh, labs, then he wouldn't have been able to do X, Y, and Z. I mean, I think it's, you know, it gives students opportunities to, can we replicate that in a school? You don't have to go and buy a, a million dollar piece of machinery or a $500,000 piece of machinery. You could have that virtually. So I think that, you know, in terms of those things. It's, it's exciting times and I'm sure that parents are sitting at home going, wow, I wish I could go back and go to school all over again. In fact, I'm sure many of us think the same thing because the opportunities that our young people have um, are, are just astounding, really, and how it's going to open doors. Mm. And as you said, bring them to places that they could never have dreamt of going to mm. before. What does it look like, David, at Dwight? What, what does the, this whole, not just the immersive education piece, but the use of the virtual world in education today? What, what's it look like? Yeah, I mean, I think for me, um, it's down to you. You make a good point about um, the, the quality of learning, the quality of education, but it's very much looking at the well-being of the child and the engagement is the big one for me. So I think, you know, for us in terms of online learning, uh, learning through technology, it's trying to have it so it's live learning, it's synchronous learning to give students that experience. Um, we're quite fortunate in that at Dwight School Dubai, Dwight actually has an online school, Dwight Global, so we've been able to tap into how they how they uh, teach the children, keep them engaged. Um, and we've moved away from recorded lessons and everything that can be done in students' own time. The students want that engagement or interaction, and we need to know about their well-being as well. Um, so we, in, in our structure, we would have that live lesson time, but we'd also have that time to check in on a child's well-being, to actually ask how they are coping, um, what, what they need from the school outside of the sort of subject curriculum teaching if you like mm. and that's been a really important part of it you know we've managed to keep our school open the whole academic year which we're really proud of and it has involved as Paul was saying teachers upskilling and being very very flexible but actually at the other end of the screen are a group of students that um, for whatever reason may not be able to get into school so are we meeting their their own personal individual needs in addition to their academic needs uh, and try not to give them too many platforms to, to worry about. Um, so like you said, Seesaw in the lower school, it might be Google Meet in the upper school. So they're not moving around multiple platforms. They become very expert and familiar with one platform and then we feed in the different technology within that. L let me throw a, a bit of a contentious question out to you. You know, we're, we're in a very privileged part of the world we live in Dubai where we have access, thankfully, to, you know, 3G, 4G and 5G in, in mo many parts of the city. And, and that certainly is developing and growing. Um, but there are immense swathes of the world where children have, haven't even got access to basic education and school. Um, is the divide going to grow, do you think, between those that have and those that haven't, particularly as this virtual world and these new technologies become even more pertinent in education today, how young people are learning and the skills that they're developing. You know, it, it's an, mm -hmm. I'm not trying to ask the question, Paul, as an ethical question, but more just as a point of debate in terms of the, the continuing divide in the world in terms of access yeah. to equality in education. Well, uh, it, I mean, it is fundamentally, it is an ethical question anyway, but, mm -hmm. uh, you know, educationally, I think there's always going to be a divide between those that can and those that can't afford a certain education. Um, uh, you know, I, I was lucky enough to take a group of students to Tanzania years ago and um, we fitted solar panels and solar, solar lighting in, in people's um, huts and mud huts and the first set we fitted we, the lady came in and turned the lights on and burst into tears and these were all 14 year old boys who stood there didn't understand what they'd done wrong mm. you know they thought they'd done a good thing and I was trying to explain to you you've, you've moved her out of the dark ages you can literally choose you know those children now have an opportunity to read 
in the evening because you've fitted these lights that cost forty dollars. So there's always a you know there's always going to be that divide. I, I, my children are incredibly adept on a computer, on a smart. I mean, they, you know, all kids I think laugh at their parents when their parents are finger tapping <laughs> and stuff like that. But but they they can multitask. I'm not sure anyone really multitasks, but they can. They're much faster. In, in processing the stuff and you know a new phone comes out and they they've done it like that so so as we as schools and companies become more reliant on on advanced technology the people that have had access to it during their school career will have, they're going to have a leg up and that, that that's you know that's just part of of life i think the, i guess the, the the ethical part of that is how do we create cheap uh, usable um, mm. devices that can be that can be given to to places in the world where they can't access it without falling down the rabbit hole of having children making those devices in the first place you know how do you you know because uh, there are I mean, there, I'm sure there are lots of people with tablets sitting at home that could just send them to 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 Africa and yeah, you know, or not just Africa I mean you know we we ran a lot of things in in Shanghai and I'm sure that it's exactly the same here in the Middle East that you Five miles from our school were, were people living in dreadful conditions mm. and nobody chooses it. But I guess that's the challenge, isn't it? The challenge of us and our privilege and the privileged world that we do live in. Um, there are opportunities there, aren't there, in terms mm. of what we build as an education system to make sure that um, we, we support and we make, certainly make our young people aware so that they can make that difference in the future because mm -hmm. this virtual world isn't going away, yeah, is it? Yeah. If anything, it's going to move at such a speed that we'll get left behind. Um, yeah. How do we make sure, Craig, that you know, our young people how, are ethically minded? Um, how do we keep them grounded whilst the world moves at such an extraordinary pace with information literally at the touch of a fingertip yeah. You know, in a very virtual world? I think the point you made, your first point in terms of the divide, I think the divide's there. I mean, it's not just about education, it's about, you know, well-being and medicine and health and, and you know, the, sort of the fundamentals and pre, even previous to education. I think if you go back to the sort of, the, we, we were talking about VR, I mean, one of the best ways to move anyone to do anything is to get some understanding and some empathy. So imagine if we take our students through a VR environment and we actually make them, we transit them and say, right, well, here's a piece of curriculum. Now we're going to move you to place X. And this is how those students experience that curriculum. This is what it feels like to be in that situation. How do you now feel? What do you want to do about it? You know, and, and, re and I mean, that would just be amazing. I'm sort of getting shivers now just yeah. thinking about it. I mean, and it'll be the young people who go, well, that can't happen. We need to do something. And they will be the ones who do something, right? They'll come up with, a new piece of tech that's you know one hundredth the cost, or you know, or or something, whatever. I don't I probably can't even think about what they could come up with. But yeah, you know, they will be the movers and shakers to say, well, actually, that's not good enough. I mean, I think if you look at that, and if we can do that on scale, it's, it's that mass movement of of strength of the young people behind it that will actually mean that the policymakers, us, um, the educators, uh, and them themselves, when they get to that point, actually you know, change that and make that a better world for everyone. It's not going to be easy. Absolutely not. I mean, we're talking about a fairly significant divide, but I think you know, starting with that empathy, and as you said before, you know, getting that really depth of understanding of other people's situation would be really important. Great way to do it. And I think the key thing in all of this, you know, David, is that just because we're using technology, just because we're moving into a virtual world, and just because we are very lucky and privileged, doesn't mean that we have to lose sight of the core values of who we are as people and and that that core curriculum delivery and ethical delivery and debate and discussion that we have in terms of critical thinking and awareness with our young people if anything as craig has said we enhance it i mean talk to us about what you're doing at twice I, I think absolutely i think we, we've got to remember that we're talking about technology here but fundamentally learning is learning and of course learning in the classroom with the teacher with with their fellow students and you know, I, I agree, w whether it's a policy level, whether it's an individual school level, we, we should be educating our children to have those, those core values. And I think, I think they do, and I think we work with parents with that, but it is giving those examples. So at the school, it might be that looking at a particular service project, uh, looking at a particular case study. It can be in many different forms. It can be within one lesson or it can be across multiple subjects within the curriculum but i think it's just that awareness of of the world 
um, and not being insular to that classroom or to Dubai or to a world of technology. You know, who are we as people? I mean, fundamentally, we want our students, our children to graduate with, with excellent qualifications and grades, but actually, we want them to graduate as very tolerant, respectful people that have those ethical core values. And I, and I, I believe our children do have that. And our job is simply to steer them through leading by example, but also giving them the opportunity to contribute. So it might be, like Paul was saying, it could be as specific as a, a project to support a school in Tanzania, or it could be um, something that is ongoing. So there's an ongoing connection with another school. So we as a school would partner with other schools so that children can talk to each other and share their experiences to develop that sense of, of mm -hmm. empathy and understanding. We, uh, and I think it's important that parents understand that we have to embrace new technologies, we have to embrace the virtual world, but it doesn't mean that we lose our heart and soul of who we are, does it? You know, schools fundamentally will still work with young people in terms of, you know, rights and wrongs and making good decisions. And, mm -hmm. and that's our job as educators, isn't it? Well, in, in, in fact, I mean, it, it potentially could do, it could, as you say before, actually Enhanced. give the opportunity to, to be placed in the situations where students, you know, are safe to explore yeah, and develop that empathy. We we actually um, we had a um, Thursday. Yeah, we had a a, a a group of children from Harare in Zimbabwe uh, on online with a group of our children uh, as part of World Reads. Um, and it was really interesting because they, they were they were going through a particular poem, but it was in, it was incredibly interesting to hear about uh, the 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 kind of feeling of being trapped um, that that our children felt. Um, Compared to to the, the situation that those and I and I know that our um, our kids were, were very moved by you know I think I think they I know we talk about first world problems and I know it's easy to turn around and do it but um, it, a lot of the time the children don't have more of a perspective than what they have access mm -hmm. to so widening that that access widens the perspective. Your, your example leads us absolutely perfectly in, and I'm going to throw the question to David because he, because he sits at the end, he thinks he gets the question last, so he's got time to think. I get to, so, I get to pinch all of your ideas and then add one so of my own. I'm going to start down at the end this time, but it, it follows on absolutely perfectly, Paul, from what you've just exemplified there. The question is, from a parent, you know, how have schools used technology to their advantage during the pandemic? How has it, how has it improved our schools? How has it actually moved us a step forward. Um, your example of that, you know, the case study, the young people in, in two completely different continents having discussions about what feeling trapped means to them. Can you give us an example perhaps of how Dwight has actually used technology to your advantage over the last 14 months? I think not, not necessarily to advantage, but to not use an excuse for not doing something. I think for me during the pandemic, um, we could use that as an excuse for learning to stop in many ways. So we've tried to embrace technology both from a, from a communication point of view in terms of how we um, communicate with parents that we would love to have in the school face to face, but we've asked what they would like uh, in, in terms of how they communicate, communicate with us. But from an education point of view, I mean, one of the most amazing things that I witnessed uh, this year was a, a model United Nations event that had been organized and our students were actively involved. And I sat with the students who were obviously social distance and, and, and all the protocols were followed. But I thought it was an amazing experience because there's an example where they were obviously talking about global issues, uh, poverty, famine, uh, globalization, but they were connecting with children in other schools, really critical thinking, really evaluating the situations. And that was a great example of how technology enhanced not just their technical skills, but their their empathy and their compassion and their debating and their critical thinking. Um, and actually, I think that in a way, that made the conference the fact that it was so, so well organized, but actually all of the students were able to fully participate through the technology. And that, that to me was great because you know, if we're not careful, we can say we can either run away from the technology or in some cases we can just be reliant on technology. But I think for many schools, it's being able to understand when it's really, really useful. And rather than not doing something to make sure that it's in place so that our students continue to have 
high quality learning experiences. But even the basics, you know, certainly I think as a school, when I look particularly across the primary phase, we were, we were much better at communicating through sort of technology with older students. But I look at our use now of Microsoft Teams mm -hmm. and literally no child is left behind. And, you know, KHDA's joke about the fact there is no, no such thing as a rain day in Dubai anymore <laughs> because learning can still continue. Um, any other practical sort of ways, for example, I'll come to you first, Paul, because you're, you're in a school, whereas Craig, you're, you're about to open a school, but practical ways that you've used technology um, to sort of actually enhance what's happening for the student on a day-to-day -day level? Um, yeah, we, we, we have a lot of VR. Um, we can't use it at the moment, unfortunately, because of uh, the nature of COVID. So, so it's been a, a challenge to kind of move down that. That's, that's made it hard. There, there's been some really simple things. That, that, um, we do a lot of work with student voice and, and using the technology to get quick feedback, using Microsoft Forms yeah. or, or Google Forms, whichever we use Microsoft um that's been really particularly with respect to the children's well-being it's yeah. it, it's given you almost a traffic like every day yeah. where you can just check up um to to things that i don't think we'd we'd we've probably experienced both as as um teachers and parents that the, the parents evening of of kind of <laughs> queuing in a hall and and you know mm -hmm. jostling for position and that's now gone uh, we'll I, i'll be surprised if we ever move back to to that kind of parents evening you know for so there, there are sort of wins that have come out of it but i don't think we'll really see the major shifts um most we we already were a, a bring your own device we we i think we we've we've got better at um working collectively on documents and, and getting the children to do that and that's been quite useful um but i, I don't know how far you'll you'll shift down until the covid restrictions are taken away and actually they can share the, the the hardware as well as using the software in the same way. When once once the hardware becomes open, uh, I, I do think it will be a game changer. And I do think all the things that we mentioned earlier about having that, being able to put people in that environment and that, have them actually experience it, particularly through the VR, um, that will be really interesting. I'll, I'll I'll let you know how that goes. Good. But it has forced change, hasn't it? It's it forced us into action when we couldn't yeah. have imagined it. Craig, you know, looking forward to opening a new school in relation to this, what, what do you think the initial impacts will be? Because it's likely that you'll still open a school under some form of COVID restriction. Sure. I, look, at just I suppose some of the other value added, I think, I, I think going back to some of the, some of the points raised, that you raised was, I, th I think what it's done is it's, it's taken away the excuses. Before it was too easy to say, you know, let's bring 500 children together across 10 schools. It was just too hard. Yeah. You know, it's too hard to, you know, I'd, timetables and students and buses and this and the rest now you know teams with a thousand children it's easy it's 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 just taken away that excuse i mean i i remember um attending a, a conference by the rgs students in in guildford and they they had access to speakers from all over the globe now now those people would not have been able to travel to guildford to speak to those students and you know, therefore you know but but through teams and through access of it it's just become that's become the norm now so the excuse is gone that you can't access people that you can't get additional school that you can't collaborate that you can't you know bring students together for things like mun or for you know school sharing and pairing so it's just taken all that away now so it's it's that is the norm yeah and the other thing that's taken away actually is you know those guest speakers because we've done the same they previously would have charged you you know <laughs> five thousand dirham a day plus the yeah. flight plus the hotel now they do it for free because it's just a half an hour on a quick zoom yeah, call it's yeah. great yeah it's you're absolutely right it's quite open lots think, of doors i think also um Craig Paul, right, and it's also with the parents, like you said, and also with as professional development for teachers as well, being able to jump onto yeah. a call and, and learn about effective uh, pedagogy in terms of IT teaching. Sure, you know, we can we can jump on again. It would have been organising a venue, and and now actually we can get easily get 30, 40 teachers together and demonstrate it. And feedback is instant with with students as well. You drop into a lesson, you can the teachers instantly give feedback individually and collectively, and even going in and marking online. So I think the feedback has been a real benefit. I think somebody must be feeding you guys the the parent questions through an earpiece because <laughs> the next question from a parent actually fits in really well, David, with what you've just started to talk about there. Um, but it, but it's quite specific. The question it's what training have we given to staff to actually get up to speed and to 
to, to keep ahead of the game in relation to technology specifically, mm -hmm. so that the quality of what we deliver in school and what we do with our young people is, is at its cutting edge. Um, let me start with you on that, Paul. You know, what training have you had to put in place as a school? So teams, um, teams are one note, um, yeah. using the uh, a group group working on the documents. So that was, that was it, the first sort of move. Um, then it was breakout rooms because you, you know, as you say, it, it's it's okay yeah. having thirty, or, you know, twenty two in our case for people in a in a room, uh, virtual in a room. But there are going to be very few that are, that are going to have the confidence to speak out as they would in a classroom. You know, so so yeah. you 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 can. Uh, so we needed to show people how to use a Teams properly, how to use breakout rooms properly, how to use OneNote, how to um, feedback. Um, one of the things we've implemented is a daily um, message to parents. Uh, so it's a bespoke. So every parent gets a, a message every day to say exactly what their children have, have learned that day in a, in a kind of key line. So it, might, you know, it may just say, um, Paul worked on, on algebra today, uh, chapter one of, of textbook two, yeah. you know. Um, and that's part of engaging the parents in there to avoid the, you know, how how'd you go at school today? All right, what happened? Nothing, you know, it's to avoid mm -hmm. that. So, so we, we've had to give the staff sort of some training on that. For, I think fortunately a lot of, um, a lot of international schools have got quite a young staff body, so they don't, then maybe less reticent to, to sort of throw themselves at the technology. Yeah, and, and not just that, but international, you know, if you're brave enough to jump on a plane and travel yeah. 3000 miles to teach in a school internationally, you usually are quite a resilient and yeah. forward-thinking mm. and courageous person yourself. So teachers have absolutely taken risks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and if I if I think back to last March, the, those first couple of weeks of hesitancy, I mean, they dissipated so quickly because teachers adapted so quickly. But yes, I mean, I think every school has put put training in place, haven't mm. they? I, I would, yeah. I would, I would be amazed. Uh, I mean, my sister-in-law is a teacher in the UK. Um, and, and they're in very deprived area and, and they've really i mean they've struggled so badly because they don't have access to the to the hardware to, so and that brings us on to the next question actually um and, and i'm just conscious that we're nearly on half an hour which is incredible that this conversation could go on for the next few hours but craig a, a question from a parent is you know we talked about the fact that we're privileged here that we have great technology in our schools and great access to that technology and paul has just exemplified you know a, a family member who's having difficulties because yeah. of the lack of availability of technology. The question from the parent is, will the using of advanced technology here, for example, create a difficulty for some students who will have to change either schools or countries in the future? Are we actually creating part of the gap in terms of what we're doing? It's an interesting dilemma. Mm. You can see Craig loves that question. I love it's that question. Tough one. No, I, I think what I'd say there is I think yeah, every school with a focus on education, a focus on children's wellbeing, will bring something different to the party. So yeah. we're lucky enough that we can bring you know, a really strong education um, infrastructure, yeah. and, and like you say, devices and internet, and you know all these sorts of wonderful trainings from within the region. And this, I think, you know, if a child, it's it's more about going back to what you said before. It's about the skills and the fundamental learning, and and that, that adds value to learning. It's not the end point; it's part of the puzzle. So I think if ch if children get those you know those skills in terms of critical thinking analysis etc cetera, etc cetera, and they take those with them to their next setting they'll be just as successful there but in a different context and that school will add great value with whatever context you know, I'm just trying to think you know, if I was a school in the middle of a rainforest wow what an amazing opportunity that would be right would I love to have a rainforest absolutely I'd love to have a rainforest I'd love to have a rainforest and great at tech but, you know so maybe one school has one and one school has another so and I think that's the point what we're doing all the time is that we're adding value and parents should worry that there might be gaps in other parts of the world because children are resilient and actually they'll use that skill and expertise in a different way and they're, they're very adaptable. Um, gentlemen, we're coming to the end of our conversation. I'm just wondering if succinctly you can sort of give your final thoughts to parents on you know, education and the future. If we had got that crystal ball today at the end of the, this wonderful two days that we've had together, what would be your final points? David, I'll start with you down that end. Okay, I think, I think for me, in some ways it doesn't matter what the curriculum is or even what the level of technology is it is about um equipping our students our children to have those transferable skills so as they progress through each stage of education move to university start thinking about their chosen career they have developed skills from their school environment that are going to equip them everything from 
what we said about the, the core values and the, and the ethics right through to use of technology and critical thinking. But if we have a skills-based curriculum, then, then I think that that's, that's the way forward. Brilliant. Thank you. Craig, final thoughts from you this afternoon? So I'm, I'm going to crystal ball in a very positive manner that, you know, I see that immersive ed tech will be commonplace in a lot of places in the world. And I think it will add value in terms of the development of skills and attributes, as we said before, empathy. And I'd hope to think that through that, then we'll, we'll start to shrink the divide. You know, something will actually happen positively. I mean, sort of Moore's law, right? How do, in 10 years time, you know, maybe you can pick up a phone for 10 cents. Who knows? I mean, let's hope so, right? Yeah, and I do. Get yeah. that out to everyone. Well, that'd be great. Paul, final thoughts of the day? Yes, sir. Uh, I think it is. There, there will be. There'll always be a divide. Unfortunately, there'll always be a divide. I think that um, schools will continue to embrace education. One of the one of the things that I found great about moving to San Mark was uh, was the, the the children are very empathetic, and I, I got a lot of support when I first arrived because I get lost everywhere. So it was mostly walking me around the school to the right places. They were great, but um, we talk about them being privileged, and they are. But that we know that privilege for them comes at a cost. Uh, for a lot of them, you know, being away from family in, in, in their home countries and things like that. So so it isn't, um, privilege doesn't mean easy for them. It's, it's, it's a different kind of hard that they, that they deal with. But, uh, but yeah, they, you know, they are, they are lucky in so much that they will be at that cutting edge. Um, and just to retain that growth mindset and to have that empathy that we've all, we've all, I think we all push in all of our schools. Okay. That is going to keep, keep those, you know, children managing the technology rather than the technology managing the children. Mm. And I, I suppose in the context of keeping us at that cutting edge, we've been incredibly privileged to have two days of incredible panels from incredible guest speakers across an array of schools, um, the experts that lead the, the incredible schools that are in this city that we all have access to. Uh, my thanks to David, to Craig and to Paul um, for your contributions this afternoon. Really good to have you here. Really good that we've ended on that positive note of looking to the future and that feeling that the future is positive and that we can embrace everything that we've learned through this pandemic to make school and education a better place for all children. On behalf of the School and Nursery Show, um, our thanks to you for joining us today or indeed in the future, wherever you may be. Um, great that we're using the technology to reach out to you in your homes. It's been my pre pleasure and my privilege to be here for the last two days. So on behalf of us all, thank you so much from the School and Nursery Show.